Yes. After suffering through Rings of Power, I needed a bit of a palette cleanse, and I will never forgive Rings of Power for the images that are conjured in my mind when I encounter the names Celebrimbor, or Elendil, or Numenor. I just mm, wish I had a different image. Even Galadriel now, depending on the scene, I picture Morvid Clark. But happily, we are not here to talk about Rings of Power. <laughs> I cannot tell you how happy I am about that. We're here to talk about J.R.R. Tolkien's work that started it all. The Lord of the Rings. Years ago, I did a video talking about the Fellowship of the Ring when I first read it. And outside of Patreon, I haven't really talked about the Lord of the Rings or any of J.R.R. Tolkien's works um, since then on my channel. We read The Silmarillion together on Patreon, so we like did a chat about it and... Did I vlog it? I want to say they made me vlog it too. I'm not sure, but we don't. <laughs> that's on Patreon. So and nothing on the main channel since that fellowship video. So I haven't done a should you read it video. And now that I have reread the trilogy, um, I thought I should do one. I am here to talk about the books, I promise. But I think it's dishonest to pretend that people's experience of the books will not have been in some way affected by their relationship to Peter Jackson's films. So I want to talk about that first. Presumably, if not the majority, although I would say probably the majority, but if not the majority, a not insignificant number of people who are considering reading Lord of the Rings are doing so because they are at least familiar with like the existence of Peter Jackson's films. Maybe they haven't seen them. That seems unlikely to me that someone is considering reading them for the first time and has not seen the films. But even if they have not seen the films, they have seen like stuff from the films. Anyone who like lives in the West, whether they've seen the film or not, they would recognize images from the films. They know what the characters look like. They know what the scenes look like. They've probably heard bits of the music. It is so in the cultural zeitgeist. It's so you can't escape it. You're going to if you're at all in fantasy spaces, you've definitely seen something from the Peter Jackson films. And if you're considering reading the books, odds are it's because you enjoyed Peter Jackson's films. Of course, it's possible that you saw the films and hated them. And that's why you want to read the books because you're like, Ugh, are the books this bad? But I'm guessing that's not the majority of people who are considering reading them. So I'm gonna kind of ignore that demographic because that demographic makes no sense to me. And so as I said at the beginning of this section, your experience of these films, be it just a, a snippet of it or having seen them more times than any human should, <laughs> this will shape your experience of the books if you've seen the films first. And in this day and age, it's much more likely that you've seen the films first. And if you like the films, I have both good and bad news for you. And if you hate the films, I have both good and bad news for you. <laughs> the films are extremely faithful in their adaptation in many respects, but they also diverge extremely from the books as well. Whether these are pros or cons for you will largely depend on whether you like the films and also on which part of the story we're talking about specifically. So before we get into talking about the books, I want to say to the people who are familiar with and love the films, the books feel slower than the films because they have a lot of lore and poetry and description. The books also feel faster than the films because while the films linger on things like battle and action sequences, the books really don't. So sequences in the films that take a substantial amount of the runtime they, we get through those pretty quickly in the books because we're not devoting a huge amount of the word count to those parts of the story. But okay, it's enough about the films. I've said in other videos, in my most recent video, that I am no Tolkien scholar. But this is a case where I think that's actually a boon. Because someone debating whether or not they should try reading Tolkien at all, in my humble opinion, should probably not be going to a Tolkien scholar, a Tolkien expert to find out whether they should try it or not. Someone who can quote chapter and verse of the Legendarium is not going to be helpful to the lay person who has heard of the name Tolkien and that's about it. When you are intimately acquainted with something, it is much more difficult to put yourself in the shoes of somebody for whom this is completely new and how it will appear to the untrained, inexperienced amateur eye. So being myself neither a novice nor an expert, I think I'm pretty much precisely in that sweet spot to be perfectly suited to this task. So
I am a grimdark girly who loves the Peter Jackson films. And my experience the first time reading these books, while being far, far from a bad experience, I did not love them the way that I had hoped that I would. However, I feel differently now, and I think that my experience can be instructive to somebody who's considering picking these up. So to me, Lord of the Rings, I have been very open and honest about this, it was the Peter Jackson films first. It came out when I was a kid, I saw them all in the cinema, and it was only years and years later after I've seen the films many, many, many times, had practically memorized them, that I finally started reading The Fellowship of the Ring. It's not technically true because I did read a teeny bit of The Fellowship, like right after the film came out, but I don't really count that because I think I read maybe 50 pages. And I was, I think, in elementary school or middle school. It just, I, it doesn't count. So obviously I knew that the stuff that happens in the films was not canon, but it was canon in my heart, if you will. Reading the books when something happened that was different from how it was in the, in the films, either in how it was portrayed or on how it unfolded or any, whatever it is. If the book did it differently, that to me felt like a betrayal of what was canon to me, again, emotionally. I knew you know, intellectually, that Tolkien's work is canon. But to me, what Lord of the Rings was, was the films. So when the books would be different from the films, that emotionally felt like a betrayal of the story that I knew. Again, I'm not arguing that it is. It just, that was the emotional experience of reading it. I was like, hey, that's not how this goes. Or, hey, that's not how this happened. Or, hey, it was different in the movies. I like the movies better. You can't help your emotional experience. That's how it felt to me. And while I knew events in the books would be different, both because you just kind of know that regardless, uh, no matter how loyal an adaptation is, you know some things will have been changed. But I also had talked to people who had read the books and had seen videos and, and was generally familiar with some of the big changes. So I knew not just that something would be different, but I knew a lot of the things that would be different. But what I was not prepared for was just how different the style and the tone of the books is to the films. And because I love the films so much, different, was bad. And then I also just wasn't as familiar with the songs, with the lore, with the names, with the history. Again, I had the films practically memorized, and while the films do include a good amount of lore, they don't scratch the surface of what's in the books and certainly not what's in the Greater Legendarium. There's just so much more in the trilogy, and what's in the trilogy is a drop in the bucket compared to what's in the other extended canon. Now I think that films or no films, films aside, I think it's fair to say that a lot of things improve upon reread. Longtime viewers of the channel will know that I am a big, 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 big fan of The First Law by Joe Abercrombie. Leanna is bringing up First Law when no one was talking about that. I am shocked. Shocked. Well, not that shocked. I think my reading experience of the First Law trilogy and the Lord of the Rings trilogy has a lot in common. I'm not joking. The first time that I read The Blade itself, which is the first book in the First Law trilogy, I actually didn't really like it. I'd never heard of grimdark as a genre, so I was in no way prepared for the style and tone of what I was about to be reading. And just like with Fellowship of the Ring, it was several years before I came back and actually finished the trilogy. So when I came back to the first law, this time knowing what I was getting myself into in terms of the tone and the style, I found that I actually really enjoyed it. There was a lot of names, a lot of subplots, the story itself didn't really seem to have a purpose or to be clearly going in any particular direction. So while it was enjoyable as a reading experience, it was far from an instant favorite with me. When I reached the last installment, The Last Argument of Kings, which is the final book in the First Law trilogy, just like when I reached the final installment of Lord of the Rings with The Return of the King, I felt compelled to give each of them a wholehearted five stars. And it left me with a very positive impression of both trilogies upon reaching their conclusions. So a while later, when I started from the beginning again, my lasting impression being quite a positive one from the conclusion of the trilogy, I was much more positively disposed towards the books. Reading the first book for the second time, I was obviously prepared for the style and tone that I would be encountering. I was also much more familiar with the world, with the names, with the places, with the general arc of the story. And so I felt much more at home in the world and felt like I could sort of comfortably enjoy my time revisiting this world and going through the tale this time, kind of noticing things that slipped by me the first time. And the structure of the trilogy being more one story split into three parts felt natural and right to me the second time. And at this point, I'm not sure if I'm talking about Lord of the Rings or the First Law. And this is what I mean. Something that is easily understood and enjoyed the first time. There's nothing wrong with that, but 
it oftentimes also means that there's nothing worth revisiting. Whereas a story that has a vast world with a lot of characters, a lot of detail, a lot of nuance, a lot of depth, that can feel really overwhelming the first time that you read it. It can even feel slightly off-putting, but it can grow to become a cherished favorite if you go back to it over and over again. So for me, coming back to First Law, which I have read so many times now, it feels like returning to an old favorite. It feels comfortable. It feels familiar. I don't have to think about it. When I'm reading the blade itself, I could pick up any random page in it and I know what scene this is, I know what we're doing here, I know how, who all these characters are, I know what they're talking about. I think for fans of Lord of the Rings who have read Lord of the Rings many, many more times than I have, I think they feel very comfortable with the names, with the lore, with the history, with, with the words, with the places, with all of this. And because they're so familiar with it, then reading Lord of the Rings feels comfortable and feels familiar and feels uh, very accessible. But if this is your first time seeing these names and places, these words, it's intimidating, it's confusing, it's bewildering, it's overwhelming, and it can often feel laborious to try to follow it. And I think first-time readers should not listen to people who are obsessed with Lord of the Rings, because they'll be given the impression that this is something approachable and easy and fun to read, and when they find that they are drowning in lore that they don't understand, they're going to be possibly put off by that, and then if they're told that they're supposed to instantly love it, like, well, I don't instantly love it, so I guess Tolkien's not for me. And that's the impression that I want to make sure you don't have. If you don't love Lord of the Rings the first time you try reading it, perhaps you never will, and that's completely fine you're under no obligation to read or to like Tolkien. But just because you don't instantly love it doesn't mean that you never will. And I think the idea that you have to know immediately if this is for you or not, if this style is for you, if this story is for you, uh, if you don't immediately feel obsessed and in love with it the first time you read it, I think that doesn't mean that you won't ever feel that way. And again, I'm not saying that it's impossible to dislike Tolkien and that anyone that says they dislike Tolkien just hasn't read Tolkien enough. I absolutely do not mean that. Just that... <laughs> The impression you might get is that people who love this love this from page one, day one. And while that is true for some people, some people do love it on page one, day one, a lot of people will come to love it over time, but not necessarily the first time through on page one, day one. So now that we have all that subjective experience expectation stuff out of the way, let's get into more specifics. Normally in a should you read it video, I include a pros and cons list. Uh, I'm not going to do that this time because anything that I put on the cons list, there's going to be a hundred comments from fans saying, that's my favorite part about it. How dare you put it on the cons list? That is absolutely a pro of the series and I just don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to present a neutral list of features of these books and this storytelling style so that you have a pretty decent idea of what type of experience you can expect if you're going to pick up these books. Number one, it's formal and distant, both because it is older and also because even for his own time, Tolkien was emulating a more archaic style to be more in keeping with the types of myths and legends that he was emulating. The storytelling, uh, the prose, the authorial voice has more in common with much, much older literary classics than with modern fantasy. For many, this is a pro, but also for many others, this is a barrier to entry because the prose is not casual. It's not easy to read in the way that Brandon Sanderson is. Number two, there's lots and lots and lots of lore. I think I made that clear already in my previous section, but this cannot be overstated. Accompanying the more formal, archaic style of storytelling and prose, there is an inclusion of history and legend and myth and tale. Characters frequently pause the action of the story to catch you up on um, the deeds of their ancestors, the history of their line, um, the history of this place that they've gone to, the, the lore behind this object that they are now encountering. Seldom is a name uttered or a place visited without an accompanying account of its history. Now this gives the world a lot of depth, but it does also slow the progress of the storytelling. Number three, it is not character driven. Now the characters in these stories are beloved, so please, please, Please do not write me an essay about how the characters are your favorite part of this story. I'm not saying people don't like the characters in this story. When we talk about character-driven stories, we are talking about stories that devote a huge amount of the word count and page count to the interior experience, the emotional, psychological state of the characters. And just as such character-driven stories have events as well, plot-driven stories have characters. It's not that they don't, but character-driven means something pretty specific and 
that is not Tolkien's focus in these stories. If you're looking for a deep dive into these characters' minds, Tolkien is not going to be delivering that for you. Lord of the Rings characters are more archetypal. They're more emblematic or symbolic of an idea. They are avatars of ideals. They resemble more characters from myth, from legend, from fairy tale than modern literary fiction novel. And this is where First Law is the opposite of The Lord of the Rings. Number four, it is morally unambiguous. This is a story about good triumphing over evil. And what is good and what is evil is heavily influenced and informed by a very Western Catholic idea of what that means. Much like in a fairy tale, what is good is beautiful and fair and clean, and what is evil is ugly and smelly and filthy. Number five, it is grand in scope. And not just because of the lore, although again, it cannot be overstated, the amount of lore. Unlike a lot of modern books and stories uh, that kind of choose their POVs and kind of stick to those POVs to tell you this story, Lord of the Rings hops around and uses any and all perspectives it needs to to tell the story it wants to tell. The narrator also addresses the reader like a storyteller in the room with you, uh, telling you about things that the characters haven't seen yet, don't know yet, that haven't happened yet. A good example of this that's not very spoilery would be Bill the Pony. The The fellowship is forced to part from Bill the Pony, and that's, that's kind of sad. But the narrator jumps in kind of almost like a, a parent that's reading a story to their kid and sees the kid is kind of upset by what's happening and the parent is like, oh, but don't worry, the story ends happily. So the narrator jumps in when we're leaving Bill the Pony to tell you that Never fear, Bill the Pony's gonna be fine. Our characters don't know that yet. That's not That hasn't happened yet. But Bill the Pony is gonna be fine. This is gonna happen to Bill the Pony. But anyway, back to the story. <laughs> so this list of, of features is not meant to be an exhaustive list and is not meant to be a list of what people love about the story or what people hate about the story. It's just supposed to be a representation of the type of experience that it is to read Tolkien's work neutrally. <laughs> this is the type of storyteller that he is. This is the nature of this work. It's meant to prep you for the tone, for the style, for the authorial voice and the authorial intent. If you're interested, yes. If you're sort of interested, maybe. And if you're not interested, well, no, but why are you watching this video? I've seen a lot of people recommend that you read The Hobbit first to try out Tolkien to see if Tolkien's style is for you, and I understand why that's a recommendation people might make, uh, but I don't co-sign that recommendation. I would not agree. By all means, if you're interested in reading The Hobbit, read The Hobbit, but I don't think you should regard The Hobbit as a good sample to determine whether or not you should read The Lord of the Rings. I think they are quite different, and I think you could easily really like the one and really dislike the other. So I don't think it's going to be a good representation of your experience. If you are interested and perhaps somewhat familiar with the story, with the work, with the lore, etc., and are prepared to be patient with this story, then I think you should absolutely give it a go. And if you're an audiobook person, I cannot recommend highly enough Andy Serkis's narration of the books. Just guess. If what I've described to you does not sound like your cup of tea, it doesn't mean that you won't like it, because for many people Tolkien is the exception. Tolkien has written the type of story that a lot of people will say, oh I generally don't like that type of thing, but I like it when Tolkien does it. I generally don't gravitate towards that type of storytelling, but I do like Tolkien. So he is the exception for a lot of people, so even if what I described doesn't totally sound like your jam, maybe try it out. You might like it. But if it really sounds like your worst nightmare, <laughs> what I've described, then don't read it, because no reader not even a fantasy reader, is obligated to read or love Tolkien. And if you have read it a bit and weren't totally in love with it and want to try again or want to reread it after some time has passed, uh, kind of like the situation that I was in when I came back to it, and you're wondering if you should come back to it, well, judging from my experience, I would say, yeah, you should try it again. That doesn't mean you will definitely like it the second time better than you did the first time. There is no guarantee of that but it's certainly a possibility. Reading Tolkien is a little bit like drinking from a fire hose the first time. Once you are more comfortable with it, it's easier to kind of tread water and swim through it. Once you know the names, the places, the lore, etc., it can feel very comfortable. It can feel like an old, well-worn coat that you can easily slip into again. So I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you agree or disagree. Let me know everything that I got wrong. As if you don't need my permission to do that, you have already begun doing that, I'm sure. But uh, regardless, let me know your thoughts and I'll see you in my next video.